Okay, so welcome everybody to this session. Um, we're going to be focusing on, on pricing, which is a pretty complicated subject, but thankfully I've got three very bright and experienced people here with me who are going to take us through uh, some of the intricacies around pricing, how to achieve pricing excellence, uh, especially in today's business context where we've got an unprecedented level of, of transformation which is ongoing and taking place uh, as going through it. Uh, so in terms of format, I'll start by uh, giving a quick introduction to our, our panel. Um, they prepared a couple of slides, so they, they want to talk on a few specific areas themselves. Then we'll jump into, um, I've got a huge list of questions that I want to go through, but we'll, we'll try and, if we've got time, try and get some questions from the audience so that you can uh, try and get their, their knowledge and extract their expertise uh, for specific areas that you're interested in. Um, so without further ado, let me start and introduce Proteek. So, Proteek is a, a principal partner at, at Standev, a, uh, a systems integrator uh, here in the Bay Area, um, focusing on, on CRM and quoted cash. Um, Proteek himself hasn't been there very long, is already advising some pretty impressive uh, clients, um, helping with their CRM business transformation initiatives around quoted cash, uh, around pricing and customer 360 uh, viewpoints. Um, specifically, he's, uh, he's head of uh, business solution practice at Sandev. Um, most notably, he's got, he is an Aptis and Pros alum. So he's got lots of uh, depth of experience with, around pricing management and pricing optimization. Um, and I'll pass over to uh, Proteek now to just give a, a quick uh, run through of Standev and a few elements himself. Yeah, thanks a lot. So, I mean, these are all numbers. Uh, I don't want to get into them in detail, but my story is, uh, I was at Aptus, really uh, excited to be back as a uh, partner now, and I've been really happy to see the encouragement, and I'm really happy to help customers uh, from product company uh, and now transitioning to a services company. There are a lot of interesting uh, things now I can do, now that I have solutions and activities that uh, we can add value to on top of uh, Aptus. So definitely looking forward and sharing my experience on pricing strategies and uh, love to talk to folks after uh, the session on anything we can add value to. So thank you. Yeah, I mean, these are some of the accelerators uh, that we have. We don't really need to go in detail, but uh, essentially we want to focus on helping uh, folks get maximum value. What happens is when you do a transaction system, uh, which was CPQ in the older generation, you would always get effectiveness, but we feel that analytics and getting value from analytics around price transformation is really key, and that's how you can kind of get a next incremental value from investment in CPQ. Thank you. So one of the things we're gonna talk about uh, in our Q&A is the whole pricing framework of how CPQ and price guidance play together. So what I have is a typical architecture, what you would really find out when you're doing CPQ, and then once you have invested in automating and getting effectiveness, getting your insights, looking at your customer's willingness to pay, and then trying to figure out how the different customer segments uh, and how they are being priced, uh, that is the next key transformation. So this kind of gives you a high-level architecture. And in, in the, the Q&A, I'll go a little bit on details on how the architecture should look like, what are the different challenges, what are the issues with data readiness. So if you're looking to implement pricing and CPQ, what will be the right uh, format for that? Thank you. Excellent, fantastic. Thank you, Proteek. Uh, next up, we've got Vishal here, here on my left. All right, I'm going to have to read all this off because he's got a, a long list of, of stuff which he's done. He's a, he's a forward-looking entrepreneurial business leader with over two decades of experience developing, implementing sales, marketing, business development, um, and really catalyzing significant revenue growth and turnaround of underperforming organizations. He's a global leader. He's uh, managing teams across US, Europe, Asia, uh, expertise in uh, digital media, automotive, CPG, uh, retail sectors, and I'm putting that list short. <laughs> he's a pricing and monetization expert. Uh, he's a contributing author, public speaker, uh, he's formed the basis of a, a, a Harvard Business School case study, and he currently runs a value strategy team at Cox Automotive, and is pretty much shaping their automatic strategy uh, for a you know, $7 billion business with, with 26 different brands. So let me hand over to you, Vishal, to talk a little bit about Cox and, and what you want to talk about. So I just wanted to start by introducing Cox Automotive. How many of you here are, by raising hands, just tell me, in the automotive sector? 
Okay, so two, two people in the automotive sector. If you're not in the automotive sector, you probably don't know who Cox Automotive is. But uh, we have 22 market-leading brands that power the automotive ecosystem. Uh, if you are in the process of buying or selling or owning a car, you've actually used one of our services. For example, if you're searching for what car to buy, you're probably logging into kellybluebook.com or AutoTrader. Those are some of our products. That's the marketing process. If you're uh, looking for getting rid of your car, you're trading in a vehicle, you're probably using an instant cash offer that's generated by Cox Automotive. So these are a set of services that we offer to the, the largest dealers and the OEMs in the US and globally, and that helps this ecosystem be complete connected. And we are committed to innovating and creating new products and services that makes the car buying, selling, and owning process very efficient, right? So that's what Cox Automotive is all about. Uh, if you go to the next slide, the title of this um, forum is Achieving Pricing Excellence in the Age of Business Transformation. Cox Automotive is a poster child for a business that's transforming, business transformation. A um, Couple of years ago, all our 22 brands operated at, as indep independent businesses. They all had their independent sales teams and independent go-to-market strategies. But we quickly realized that our clients, who are the dealers or the, or the OEMs, they're looking for a much more integrated experience and they want to make sure that the solutions that we offer, whether it's inventory management, marketing, retailing, they all come together and provide a much more holistic uh, uh, value proposition. So that's what Cox Automotive is doing. We have created an enterprise sales team. We've, we've created integrated sales and service and integrated solutions. And that's kind of where my role comes in, my team comes in. And our role is to create solution strategies that are end-to-end -end holistic for our clients. When we do that, we have a lot of problems and a lot of complexities that we have to deal with. This slide just talks about, as you're implementing pricing excellence or solution excellence, uh, the challenges we face. We deal with unique product complexities, thousands of SKUs across a portfolio of 26 brands. Uh, packaging is an extremely compl complex exercise. If you go back to uh, when you buy a package or a bundle at McDonald's, many people want to buy a burger, fries, and a Coke. But very few people want to buy burgers, fry, fries, and a coffee, right? That bundle is actually a bundle killer. So how do you think about packaging services that fit together and meet a client's need holistically? That's a pretty complex problem we deal with. Value selling, especially in the B2B space, is extremely complex. We, data is hardly available around what drives customer value. Pricing becomes complex because at Cox Automotive, we're selling transportation, which is dynamic pricing. We're selling software, which is subscription pricing. We're selling services, which is pay as you go. We're selling risk-based insurance products. So packaging 10 different product lines with completely different pricing models is a complexity we deal with. Uh, don't want to go into the detail. The next page just talks about how we've implemented holistic capabilities to be able to handle that. And if you're in the space of pricing or if you're dealing with a pricing problem, these are five things that you want to be able to think about. And we'll talk about that more as this, uh, in the session, but it starts with a solid foundation on value research and understanding what customers value and need. And so that's a key capability. And segmentation is critical because every customer is different and using data and insights to figure out what are the unique needs of your client segments and building those algorithms and that data science to power your pricing or your offer strategy, that's a huge capability that most of you will have to encounter. The third piece is, I talked about it earlier, creating a packaging strategy, how you bring solutions together based on unique needs of the clients, right? As opposed to just selling an all-in kind of bundle without any science or rational behind it. Uh, the other two pieces that we are encountering and uh, which is an area where 
Aptus or other CPQ vendors and price optimization comes in is dynamic pricing. How do you, how do you use market signals and behavioral data to be able to price products differently and maximize profitability? And the last piece is enterprise consulting, which is what my team does is we're consulting with our largest clients around the value proposition of our products and services. And that's what, what we uh, call pricing excellence. These are the capabilities that we have built out. And most companies are trying to work, in, work towards building these capabilities out to be able to maximize the value that they can extract from their offerings. So. I'd love to talk to uh, take more questions at the end. We'll, we'll get into it. It's complicated already. <laughs> All right, I, I want to introduce uh, Asaj. Um, so Asaj, an awesome guy. He's, uh, he's an engineer turned programmer. Uh, then decided to go to business school to try and combine all these backgrounds uh, and then decided to apply it to, to pricing where he's been for a, a, almost a decade now um, after those previous careers. Uh, he's got a phenomenal background, he's worked at Sears, he's worked at EMC in the data storage division, uh, pricing hardware and software solutions there. Uh, now he works at, in the semiconductor industry doing pricing for, for touch and display drivers and synaptics. Um, and he's a firm believer that if you love working with data and applying this to business challenges, then pricing is where you need to be. So I'll, I'll, I'll let uh, Saj talk a little bit through an, another aspect of pricing, which is which is key and, and dear to his heart. Thank you, Aidan. Um, so what I, what I wanted to talk to you guys about was, uh, from an organizational standpoint, some of you may be thinking, hey, I, I'd like like to get some pricing excellence in my group. You know, what should it look like? Um, and the first thing I wanted to sort of hit on was that you need to have an independent price organization. Um, and the reason primarily is because you have a lot of different incentives um, that could be conflicting uh, within the different functional groups within your organization. Um, so for example, operations, they're focused on ca capacity utilization. Uh, your marketing team may be focused on sort of gaining, maintaining share. Uh, your finance, you know, maybe looking at, okay, what's my quarterly margin? What's my guidance to the street? How am I going to hit my targets? Um, and then your sales, um, you know, they're, they're primarily focused on sort of hitting their quotas, hitting their revenue targets. Uh, so you really need sort of an independent function to kind of get in between um, and sort of balance all of those out. Um, I, I almost say that uh, when no one's happy, when none of the function, functions are happy in the group, the, that's when you know you got the right price. So, yeah. <clears throat> so, um, the, the other reason you want an independent price organization is that you want to drive consistency. Uh, pricing has become vastly complex, uh, especially in the retail space. Uh, you have a lot of advanced uh, statistical modeling, you know, elasticity models. Uh, you've got lots and lots of data, lots of real-time data. You know, there's there's uh, retailers that are making like price moves in the intraday, you know, like changing prices within the day. Um, and then you've got lots and lots of data. So unless you've got someone who's focused on um, doing the analytics, doing the modeling, um, you know, if you've got ten other things you got to do. Um, this is not going to be a priority for you. So, um, and, and then for big organizations, you want to make sure that you have a unified pricing policy. So uh, you, you want this function to drive that consistent, consistency throughout the organization, make it simple for your sales, your customers um, in doing business with you. So from a um, organizational structure, there's no real silver bullet. I mean, in all the different industries I've been in, I've seen uh, all sorts of different models. So sort of at a high level, you've, you've got this centralized pricing model. Um, and so basically, you're giving up all the price decision making to that one central group. Um, so, so again, in retail, that's a great model because you've got lots of data, you've got lots of analytics. Uh, you really need like a dedicated team working on, on that. Um, maybe for more B2B type businesses where a centralized team doesn't understand all the products and the value proposition, you want to have a decentralized structure, right? So maybe you have uh, sort of a pricing operations group that's centralized, um, but then you let the strategy come from the individual business units. Um, and then you can have all sorts of uh, hybrid models um, that kind of span in between. 
And then um, the other, other thing I wanted to talk about from an organizational standpoint is you also want to think about who's, who's the decision maker, right? So pricing can be a sole decision function or it can also be sort of a support function. Um, and and it, you know, that could be as far as coming in as an expert when you're negotiating a deal. Um, it could also be some uh, an organization that's focused on process, right? So bringing all the running like a pricing committee, bringing all the functional groups, the functional leaders together, um, getting consensus. Um, so there's there's very different types of models, um, and depending on what industry you are in, uh, you're going to have a a uh, different structure that suits your needs. Perfect, awesome. I love that. You, you always have tension in the organization between the different functions. That's where you know you're getting it right. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. Okay, um, I've got a little quote up here. It just talks about uh, uh, pricing excellence. But, but Vishal, maybe you can tell us. Like, we've had lots of different flavors here. We've discussed different elements. But, but what, what, you know, what is pricing excellence, right? What, what are the advantage capabilities to create you know, these foundations of price, pricing excellence? Well, I think pricing excellence is a it's a kind of state, like when you've accomplished a couple of things, you could say that you're borderline getting to pricing excellence. And the first thing is, your strategy has to be based on a solid foundation of some kind of knowledge and insights, right? If you're uh, doing this to come up with pricing, yeah, you're not at pricing excellence. It's a solid foundation of cost data, competitive data, and then value, right? Understanding what, what does our product actually mean to our client. So having a foundation of knowledge is critical for pricing excellence. Uh, leadership alignment, right? If you have a pricing strategy and your chief executive officer cannot explain what it is or talk about why they charge what they charge to their clients, then you've not accomplished pricing excellence. You want the C-suite to align around what a strategy is. What's their product strategy? What's the value proposition? And what's the pricing? And it all has to come together. So they, they, you cannot claim pricing excellence unless you've got that alignment. And then execution is critical. Everybody talks a big game around pricing, and we do this and we do that. How do you execute on a day-to-day -day basis? So having the right tools, um, CPQ is a huge price optimization tools, are big. Uh, client research, value analysis tools are big. Having the right tools in place and the systems that salespeople are using on a day-to-day -day basis to execute on a pricing strategy, that's the third component of pricing. And when you've accomplished those three, I think you could say, I've got to that point. And um, uh, what capabilities you need, I think analytics is big. You have to have good analytics to drive the strategy. Research is very important talking to clients. Unless you talk to clients, you don't understand where they drive value, and you come up, you cannot optimize price. Uh, research, analytics is big, execution capabilities are critical, and change management, right? When you're gonna drive an organization that has been doing pricing in a very erratic manner to a strategic organization, the change element of it is the, probably the biggest thing. Um, so those are the elements and the capabilities that you need. Okay, to, yeah. And so, so, so we found that we know it's, it's complicated, right? We need to get we need to get CEO, we need to get executive level um, support on this. But there's a lot of elements to do, right? So we've got to do change management, we've got to do infrastructure, and after that, project. Maybe you can help, right? How, how do I sell them on this? How do I get them to jump into this journey? And how long is this journey? Definitely. So, uh, I mean, you always want to align, and I think people definitely do that in a really nice way, where you create your company objectives, then you create your pricing strategy based on your company objectives, and then you create a strategy of, hey, my go-to-market strategy is aligned with my pricing strategy, and in certain cases, I want to develop that. I think where people uh, miss or don't really account for is uh, thinking of the transaction and the strategy together. So when you're creating your ROI models and presenting to your CEO and you get a buy-in, either to do a transformation for CPQ or price optimization, you should try and also create those ROI models based on your actual real-world transaction data. Those transaction data could be uh, tied to certain KPIs that your company has uh, said that really critical for them in the next couple of years, and then develop those models and revisit them uh, all the time. So I think uh, that, that's the best way to sell this uh, solution to C-suite. Uh, business value, ROI creation, and using the transaction data you have to come up with that, rather than go, going through uh, KPIs or things that are not related to your particular business. 
And Saj, maybe you can tell us, I mean, why and how should pricing be part of corporate strategy? I mean, how do we link it in there and why does it need to be there? I would say the, the, the first thing you want to think about is how is your pricing strategy uh, supporting your business strategy, right? Uh, you know, you could have uh, you could have a group kind of go out there and say, hey, you know, we raised the price, uh, we didn't see any drop in uh, volume, we're making all this money, uh, but it could be completely counter to uh, what your overall business strategy is. So, um, so, so I think that's that's really important that um, whatever you do as far as developing a pricing strategy, make sure it fits in and enhances what your overall corporate strategy is. It cannot be sort of its own separate pillar uh, within the organization. Got it. Got it. And so when you mentioned before, Vishal, and it relates to this, is you're talking about the difference between being reactive in your pricing and being proactive in your pricing. I mean, if we're talking about what, what Saj is saying, we're, we're trying to get to proactive there. What's, take us through the, those different elements. So most of you have probably encountered a situation. I'll tell you, this is a real situation. Uh, the product team develops this amazing product. The marketing officer has an amazing campaign. The sales team's out selling it. And then the, contra the customer says, OK, great, I'm going to sign. And then they're like, what's the price? Somebody is figuring out price at that moment. That's a very typical situation with new product launches. Uh, sometimes when you have great ideas and we're negotiating deals, pricing is the last thing people consider. Right? That's reactive. The, the simplest thing that you can do as an organization is start early. Right? Make sure that the pricing decisions and the strategy around pricing is being thought as you're contemplating the product itself. And you start with thinking about value at that stage, and then as the product comes, as you get through the different stages of product life, the life cycle, you have to think through at what point do you establish the structure? What am I going to be, how, am I going to be charging this as a subscription product, or is it going to be a transactional product, and what's the pricing model? And as you get closer to the market, go to market, launch process, you have to figure out the discounting strategy, the sales compensation model, how you're going to be able to market the value proposition. So just starting early is going to be very important in the process. Uh, and then and it all flows from there. If I can put it back to you, Seth. So, uh, so how do I set up that pricing team? How do I structure that? And, and what, are, what are the different viewpoints I have from the different functional elements? You talked about that briefly in, in your slides up front. Can you give us a bit more detail on that? Yeah, so I mean, uh, to, just to kind of give you a quick example, when I was in retail, um, the way we had it structured was we had an independent organization that had sole decision, decision making. So um, all the pricing decisions happen centrally within a separate independent organization outside of the business units. And the reason it was structured that way is because retail is a very dynamic, dynamic environment. You've got uh, lots and lots of data, you've got uh, lots and lots of different products in lots and lots of different stores. Um, and with retail specifically, you can also do a lot of price experimentation. You know, you can take different groups of stores, try different strategies, see kind of what works. Uh, you can't always do that in the B2B space, but um, you can definitely do that in, in that space. So, so to support that, you want to have that core center of excellence. Um, what I found in the B2B space is that, um, so when I was with EMC, uh, you had, you know, you, you don't have a, in retail you have a product that's a, there's a 100% substitute somewhere else. Um, but in a B2B you've got sort of complex products, you've got complex selling models, you have licensing agreements, you've got these bundles. Um, so there uh, our focus was on basically driving process, having a committee, getting alignment within the internal organization. Um, so in B2B space and something like that, that's really important. Um, so it, it, it all, it all kind of depends on your organization. I mean, you really need to figure out who is the decision maker within your organization, and then how the pricing team is going to fit in. Um, are they going to support the decision maker, or are you going to take that away and give it to the pricing team because you think that the person who's doing it right now just doesn't have the bandwidth, you know, to, to do to do it right? Okay, I'm getting it. So, so independence is, is really. Critical. It's really yeah. a critical factor. Yeah. Right, okay. Maybe let's move a little bit away from that. And um, Puddy, maybe you can take us through some of the elements of, of how, how we do prices. Like, you know, very about cost-based pricing, market-based pricing, value-based pricing. Give us insight. What, what, what are? Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I'll give some examples of what you said. So, cost pr plus pricing is essentially uh, think of professional services when you're trying to uh, get a quote 
and you want to look at your internal cost and you want to make a certain margin. So typically professional services company would look at a cost plus model where you have certain elements of margin and you want to get a minimum margin uh, to do business. Your typical elements of market pricing is your, uh, when you are uh, looking at real estate markets and if you want to find out uh, home prices, they're generally market driven. And then you have what is the holy grail of pricing, the value-based pricing, where you're looking at the correct micro segment of customers, matching it up to their willingness to pay and really trying to figure out what, what is the value your product or solution is adding to that customer. So the whole journey is you go from cost to market to value, but uh, value-based pricing can also be difficult because you also want to make sure that it's not based on customer segment versus uh, based on price segment, right? If you're doing uh, customer segmentation, then you're only looking at one dimension. So that's the typical uh, uh, kind of journey and how you would go from uh, the three different pricing types. Yeah, awesome. Maybe, maybe we'll take one or two quick questions. Anybody have any kind of specific questions they want to ask? I've got a huge list here, so I think we got this one here. Yeah, I'll be very quick. Uh, so, a lot of Sorry, great discussion, can't great can't points. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we can't hear you. <laughs> Ask for questions and didn't, didn't focus so in. Thanks to all of you. Great discussion, great points. But one thing I didn't hear is uh, how important or critical it is to analyze competitor pricing, right? So, when we are setting a pricing strategy for ourselves, uh, we talked about analyzing the market, analyzing the customer needs, you know, analyzing our internal cost-based pricing, et cetera. But what about competition analysis? Proti, maybe you can, you can take that because you've been covering a little long. Actually, the uh, static... Uh... Oh, yeah, yeah. So the, the question was around uh, competitor-based pricing. Okay. Um, and how, how we can take, bring in what competitors' pricing is when we're... Yeah, yeah so uh, I think... Uh, Based on your business type and uh, what, uh, how your pricing strategy is, you definitely want to use that as an index, but it's always uh, not a good idea to use the competition as a way to price your product simply because the value you're adding or the differentiating you're doing is both qualitative and quantitative. So it's never uh, a good idea, especially in the B2B world, uh, to do that. But uh, I don't know if our speakers have any uh, perspective on the B2C world because that's where I see a bigger function uh, to use competitive data, especially in retail and those kind of use cases. You guys want to talk about competitive pricing? Let me repeat the question. What was the question around? Because I couldn't hear it. Can you just repeat that one? So the question was how critical or important is, is it to analyze the competition pricing? For example, Verizon launches some plans, right? So AT&T follows suit and back and forth, right? So how important it is in the B2C as well as B2B world to look at the competition pricing and base our pricing strategy on that? Yeah, so I, I think I agree with what Protik said, uh, that in B2C, especially in retail, right? And with all the digital retailing that's going on, it's almost impossible to not and to have a pricing strategy unless you understand what your competitors are doing in a dynamic fa fashion. And having real-time information through, through scraping and other techniques in terms of what price points do you see on other websites or other retail channels is critical. And I know that's, that's a huge piece of pricing excellence when it comes to retail and consumer products. On the B2B side, on the other hand, there are so many different elements of the value proposition. The, the salesperson, right? How much knowledge they provide the clients, how much you know about the client itself and how you can impact their profitability, that these other factors become a lot more important than just competitive benchmarking. Unless you're offering commodity products. And if you're offering commodity products, this is pricing excellence is not even worth investigating. But if you're if you're in the B2B space, if you're providing products and services that can differentiate yourself, competitive benchmarking is is good, but it's not a must-have. Okay, I'd love to ask more, uh, give time more questions, but we're running out of time, unfortunately. Um, I'd just like to finish up and ask all three of you just give very short synopsis, just maybe give a, a best practice or, or, or best takeaway, key takeaway from 
pricing excellence in, in this sort of Sad, stage. you want to go ahead? Sure. Yeah. Sad, you step <laughs> in. Um, so I, I guess uh, one thing I'll, I'll sort of emphasize is that you need to have uh, a good handle on your data. Uh, you need to be data driven. Um, you know, pricing is a little bit of an art and a science, and it's really important. Um, that, that not only do you have your data, but that you have hypotheses and that you're testing your hypotheses. So that's, that's sort of really key. Um, the second thing is uh, pricing is never done, right? You're, you're one competitor price change away from having a completely different strategy, right? So you want to make sure that um, you have a group that's dedicated, that's focused, um, that's kind of staying on top of things and that, you know, it's a very dynamic environment. Pricing is really easy to change. Um, so you want to be very careful, um, you know, as far as pricing goes, that it's not sort of a one and done type of deal. So, yeah, and my key takeaway is you look at three uh, people, process, and technology and definitely uh, look at all three holistically. Technology definitely uh, with Aptus Intelligence Cloud and the whole guidance is really critical, but you also want to make sure you have the right data readiness and the people in, uh, and the processes in place to consume that data. And then the best practices around segmentation, price guidance, those can really help you because when you buy CPQ and you want to uh, convince your CFO for the second or the third level of investment of why it is critical, you have to have a conversation more from a automation perspective to intelligence and why that will be a guidance for your salespeople when they're essentially in B2B complex deals to get more margin uplift. So yeah, that, that'll be my key takeaway. Thank you. Yeah, the one thing I'll, uh, uh, I'll talk about is many companies have pricing teams and they have like three-year roadmaps to pricing excellence, right? Don't forget the quick win. If you can actually find a quick opportunity and translate that into dollars, Success drives success. I've had to build pricing teams in multiple companies from scratch. And the way we do it is find the first $10 million of value. We'll capture yep. that, and the next $20 million will come, and the funding will come to grow the, the, the practice. So finding the quick win and the, the low-hanging fruit and operationalizing and acting on that quickly is probably the best advice I could give. Thanks very much, guys. I really apologize we ran out of time, but grab these guys afterwards. They've got a depth of knowledge in all this huge area. Um, but can you give me a round of applause for these guys? Fantastic. Really good session. Good job. <laughs> good job.